really glad to uh, be here to present some of this uh, research, especially to this audience. And uh, yeah, the title of the study is uh, Sediment Metagenomes as Time Capsules of Lake Microbiomes. Uh, so the ideas and findings in this presentation uh, came out of a little experiment that was designed to explore the potential of metagenomics uh, for uncovering the microbial diversity preserved in lake sediment DNA archives. And I think this research is timely uh, because there seems to be an explosion of interest for using shotgun sequencing in paleoecology. So today I'll try to describe how metagenomics and microbial ecology might lend a new perspective on paleoenvironment reconstructions. Uh, so lakes are teeming with microbial life. Uh, in a single drop of lake water, there are on the order of a million uh, bacteria and archaea, uh, 10 times as many viruses, and a great many microbial eukaryotes. Uh, microbiomes are fantastic study systems for describing lake conditions. Uh, the diversity of microorganisms can tell you a lot about the environment that they inhabit. Um, microbes exhibit vast metabolic and other functional diversity and uh, microbial genomes hold key information about their potential for living in environments with different you know, oxygen levels, uh, light availability, organic matter substrates, all different aspects of environments that you might wish to reconstruct. So aside from this bioindicator potential, uh, microbes are important members of lake ecosystems as exemplified by their you know, integral roles in lake food webs and biogeochemical bio cycles. Uh, there has been some pretty fascinating research in uh, paleoecology aiming to reconstruct microbial diversity from lake sediment DNA. Uh, so these paleo time series have focused on cyanobacteria, uh, microbial eukaryotes, assemblages. Uh, some really cool recent research has looked to reconstruct uh, organelle genomes, so from chloroplast and uh, mitochondria that are of microbial origin. Uh, there's been work tracing the evolution of microbial functional diversity from sediment DNA. And uh, uh, there's also been some compelling microbiome reconstructions uh, looking at other aquatic uh, systems other than lakes. Uh, so for instance, looking to reconstruct ancient archaea or uh, green sulfur bacteria, viruses, and other microbes. So these are all interesting groups that lend important insights in paleolimnology. However, the tree of life is vast and not even pictured here is uh, the diversity of uh, viruses on our planets. Uh, the microbial groups that have been, been, excuse me, the microbial groups that have been investigated to date uh, really only account for a small number of branches on the tree of life. And uh, we may in fact be overlooking a great number of major microbial groups, including important heterotrophic bacteria. And I think this might be uh, in part because uh, the single gene PCR based approaches that have dominated molecular genetic paleoluminology are just not equipped for exploring preserved microbial diversity without uh, severe limitations or biases. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the very basic question that uh, my supervisors and I posed was, what microbial diversity is preserved in lake sediment DNA archives? And uh, can we discover any preserved microbial diversity that has so far been overlooked? As I'm sure most of you have experienced, a central challenge in molecular genetic paleolimnology is differentiating historical DNA from indigenous sediment microbial uh, diversity. So we had to devise a strategy to target historical diversity in the total uh, sedimentary DNA pool. So here we used whole genome shotgun sequencing and uh, metagenomics to study lake microbiomes in a way that was blind to taxonomic affiliation and uh, genomic region. So one metagenomics tool that we leveraged to target historical DNA was fragment recruitment. So uh, fragment recruitment or metagenome mapping is a powerful experimental method that allows a researcher to essentially chart the distributions of a genome across different biomes. And so for example, uh, fragments recruitment is commonly implemented in microbial ecology to assess uh, the biogeographic ranges of uh, different genomes. So in this study, our strategy for detecting historical diversity in sediment DNA uh, was to recruit sediment metagenomes that fit the genomic profiles of surface water microbiomes. And to accomplish this, we used fragments recruitment. And I'll show you how it works in a couple of the you know, hypotheses that we formulated. 
So uh, fragment recruitment works by aligning uh, metagenome reads, so here pictured here, uh, to some reference genome at a threshold sequence identity uh, to probe the diversity of lacustrine microorganisms preserved in sediment metagenomes re recruit or map unassembled metagenome reads uh, to the surface water reference metagenome, which is assembled. So this way we can capture historical lacustrine diversity in sediment DNA. So what microbial diversity might you expect to find preserved in sediment metagenomes? So you might expect to capture uh, cyanobacteria, uh, heterotrophic bacteria, uh, such as actinobacteria that are common and abundant in uh, Lake Epilimnia. Uh, you might expect to detect viruses or microbial eukaryotes, including some that are used as classical proxies. Uh, maybe the captured metagenome will contain insightful functional gene diversity. And uh, likely there will be microbial DNA that is uh, not preserved in, sediment, in sediments, in which case it will not be mapped. And uh, finally, the sediment metagenome that is not recruited, so whatever is left over here, will likely be composed of either indigenous sediment microbiota or possibly uh, historical DNA that is not represented in the uh, surface water reference. So here's how we set up our fragments recruitment experiments. Uh, for each lake, we had a top or uh, like a top sediment metagenome that represented the first centimeter interval of the below the uh, water uh, sediment interface, and also a bottom sediment metagenome that was from about 40 centimeters deep into the sediment. Uh, we also had a surface water metagenome that was from an integrated surface water sample from about uh, zero to two meters depth uh, over the euphotic zone. And so to capture uh, the lacustrine diversity preserved in recently deposited sediments, uh, we recruited the top sediment metagenome to the surface water metagenome, so pictured here. Uh, similarly, to capture the lacustrine diversity preserved in pre-industrial age sediments, we recruited the bottom sediment metagenome to the surface water metagenome. And uh, finally, uh, to get a sense of how microbial diversity turns over in the sediments, we recruited the bottom sediment, bottom sediment metagenome to the top. And we repeated these experiments in three lakes in Eastern Canada. And there's really nothing inherently special about any of the lakes that we selected other than they were at least one meter deep and they were relatively easy to access. But uh, most importantly, their bottom sediments uh, predated the year 1880. So we were able to estimate that they are pre-industrial, at least as we define it in the Western hemisphere. So the first results that I'm going to show you answer the fundamental question, do we even detect preserved diversity using the recruitment capture approach? Uh, the first set of recruitment plots uh, show the percent of the bottom sediment metagenomes that mapped to the top sediment. And at 100% sequence identity, which you see to the left of the uh, x-axis here, uh, the aligned regions of these metagenomes are completely similar. Uh, but as you uh, move towards a 0% sequence uh, identity, they become more distantly related. Uh, the captured surface water metagenomes in the top sediments show a similar mapping trend to the captured surface water metagenomes in the bottom sediments. Uh, this trend being that uh, there is about like a pretty natural delineation of distantly and uh, more closely related to metagenomes at about 90% sequence identity. So this was the cutoff that we used in all downstream, uh, downstream analyses. Uh, so that answers the preliminary question of whether lacustrine microbial diversity is preserved in sediment metagenomes. Uh, the evidence so far uh, says yes. However, only a small fraction of the sediment metagenomes appears to be uh, recruited at high sequence uh, similarity. But now uh, we wanted to find out which taxonomic groups are contributing to this historical DNA archive. Uh, so we assessed the phylum level taxonomic diversity of the captured metagenomes, as we call them, as well as the taxonomic composition of the surface water and sediment metagenomes that were not subjected to experimental capture, and these we termed the free metagenomes. And so in these heat maps, the free metagenomes show that the microbial diversity of each of these habitats basically looks uh, how like each of the uh, taxonomic compositions looks like on its own without experimental capture. 
And uh, broadly, the taxonomic diversity of these habitats is what you would expect. So in the surface water metagenomes, uh, which is symbolized by the W here, uh, you find uh, actinobacteria, alpha proteobacteria, and beta proteobacteria, all of which are abundant and common in lake surface water, surface waters across the globe. Uh, in contrast, you also have uh, like sediment metagenomes, which are primarily composed of archaea and delta proteobacteria. Those are symbolized by the top and bottom sediment metagenomes here. Uh, but when we add in the experimental captured metagenomes, you could see that the composition of surface water, water metagenomes preserved in sediments differ from the free metagenome profiles. Uh, so in particular, we see that certain groups are enriched in the captured metagenomes, especially the taxa highlighted here. So there are viruses, uh, cyanobacteria, planktomycetes, and others. And the reason I'm saying that is you could see in the heat map that they are less represented in the uh, surface, uh, excuse me, sediment metagenomes, but enriched in the uh, captured surface water metagenomes in the top and bottom sediments depicted by the upside down triangles. Uh, looking at microbial phyla is an extremely low resolution of taxonomic diversity. So here we switch to looking at the order rank taxonomic composition. So now we see in finer resolution, uh, the groups that are represented in captured metagenomes. So again, the upside down triangles. So among these are the uh, cotoviralis, which are bacterial phages, uh, and the burkholderiales, which contain some lineages that are cosmopolitan in lakes. And in contrast, it appears that ultra microscopic actinobacteria and alpha proteobacteria are abundant in surface water metagenomes, but are very, very uh, lowly conserved, uh, covered, excuse me, in sediment and captured metagenomes. And uh, so we also want to look at it from the perspective of an ordination analysis to evaluate the variation between the taxonomic compositions of these metagenomes. And uh, we observe that captured surface water metagenomes and sediments uh, show what appears to be the preferential uh, preservation of certain groups, uh, namely the ones that I highlighted before. So the Burkholderiales and the Cotoviriales, et cetera. I listed them pretty briefly here, uh, the groups that we thought were of a special interest. So first and foremost, uh, Cotoviriales, so again, the tailed bacterial phages that we detected in sediment metagenomes seem to be pretty robustly preserved. Uh, we could think that there might be two good mechanisms explaining their robust preservation. The first one being that uh, uh, they're prophages, so their, their viral DNA could be integrated into the bacterial genomes that they infect. And uh, secondly, these viruses have uh, capsids that might be robust enough to withstand the adverse conditions of being stored over long term in lake sediments. Excuse me. Uh, but what might explain the weak preservation of these uh, ultra microscopic bacteria that we find, you know, to be so abundant in Lake Apollonia? Uh, well, first of all, they're characterized by um, streamlined genomes, low GC content, and they tend to have free living lifestyles. And uh, when I first uh, <laughs> looked at that description of the bacteria, that seemed to click and make sense, you know, if you have a low GC content, the bonds are easier to break and might lead to, you know, DNA degradation. Uh, streamlined genomes would mean that there's just less genetic material to be preserved over time. And maybe with a free living lifestyle, you don't have, uh, you know, particles to absorb onto after the cells burst and, you know, preserve the DNA in that uh, mechanism. Uh, however, uh, some members of the Burkholderiales that were preserved also matched its description. So, I, I don't have like a convincing arguments about uh, why these uh, bacteria are prefer preferentially preserved over, over the others. Mm. Uh, so we expanded the search. Um, after looking at these captured uh, metagenomes, we had a good idea of uh, which taxa to look for. And so we expanded the search in the free metagenomes to just see you know, what number of genes we could recover for each of these groups. Uh, so again, highlighted here are the groups that seem to be weakly preserved. And indeed, so especially looking, looking at uh, uh, Plantophyla and Anaphylagicus. Uh, so there are a great many genes in the surface water metagenomes, but very few in the sediments. But in contrast, uh, members of the uh, Burkholderiales Berkholder, order 
uh, polynucleobacter and limnohabitans habitats seem to be pretty robustly preserved because they, you know, we could detect a pretty sizable number of their genes. And this got us excited because uh, this group has pretty well described ecotypic diversity. So uh, within that uh, lineage, they could have uh, members of that lineage that have different ecological affinities. For example, they might have uh, preferences for pH, uh, light availability, et cetera. And this is really important in lakes because there's an incredible environmental heterogeneity that you observe in these systems. So when you try to reconstruct uh, lake environments, maybe you could put ecotypic diversity to use. Uh, so we what we tried to do, because we were somewhat limited by using the overlying surface water as our reference genome. So instead, we uh, accessed publicly available uh, reference genomes for these two groups and tried to repeat our recruitment experiments uh, using instead uh, you know, these publicly available genomes. And what you see here, uh, the references are in fact uh, the concatenation of maybe between 30 and 40 uh, reference genomes. And uh, for you know, polynucleobacter and limnohabitans. In uh, two of the lakes, you could see in the uh, surface water that there do appear to be polynucleobacter, uh, excuse me, polynucleobacter and limnohabitans that are represented, whereas in Lake Paula, you don't uh, find them at uh, such a high uh, sequence similarity. But uh, when you look in the sediment metagenomes, you just don't find any evidence for their preservation. And uh, this might be because either they're just not preserved, or it could also be that maybe these genomes just don't represent the historic, like the uh, diversity of these groups that was present over 150 years ago in these lakes. So I think this might be a pretty promising uh, avenue of inquiry for the future, looking at reconstructing bacterial ecotypic diversity to describe uh, paleo environments. Uh, but I think a big part of this is that we still need to characterize the contemporary microbial diversity in our lakes. So uh, yeah, that is definitely an ongoing project there. Uh, so just to wrap up and, uh, and conclude, so I think that deep whole genome shotgun sequencing is equipped to detect uh, like historical uh, DNA in metagenomes. However, I don't think you could expect that uh, using this uh, whole genome shotgun sequencing approach that uh, you could recover a huge amount of historical DNA. Rather, uh, probably only a small fraction of it is historically derived. But I think we were successful in expanding the known taxonomic diversity of microorganisms available to uh, paleo environmental reconstructions. And I'm especially excited about uh, our discovery of uh, you know, bacterial phages preserved in sediment metagenomes as well as heterotrophic bacteria, such as the Burkholdi reales. And uh, finally, I'd just like to reiterate that I think this uh, is a promising avenue of inquiry for the bacterial ecotypes. And uh, uh, thank you kindly to all the people who supported this research. Uh, thank you to Eric and the Sediment DNA Society for inviting me today. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. Uh, we have a first question from Alexandra Rouillard, and after Anneke and Anna. Well, yeah, okay, there is a lot, but I will do them in the order I see them. So, Alex, you uh, can how start. How do I raise my hand? As, uh, yes, you, you go to the reaction button, and you should be able to find the button and raise hand. Maybe okay. it's the button of right. yeah. Okay. So we, we, yeah. have, uh, we, we can take 15 minutes. So. We, we can uh, try to take all questions. Alexandra? Hey, Rebecca. Thank you for a great talk. Um, so you were presenting so much interesting data, and I was trying to wrap my, my head around everything you were um, presenting. Uh, so I'm sorry if I missed it, but I know that you were talking about um, preservation of the microbial DNA in the, in the like sediment. Uh, but did you did you mention anything about actual transport from the water column, especially the surface water, to the sediment layers, as as being a reason why maybe it's there or it's not there? Uh, no, but uh, I'm absolutely open to trying to understand, you know, what the mechanisms of the preservation for some of these groups are and why aren't others aren't. 
did you have something particular in mind about uh no, but it's just because you talk about preservation and the examples you were giving were a lot about uh, GC content and like certain, you know, so when you talk about preservation, it can be once it's in the sediment, what happens to it after, but I'm talking about even before it gets there. So the, the abundance maybe even of, of entire DNA being produced and, and sent to that actually gets transported to the sediment. I, I have to be honest, I hadn't gotten to, uh, that wasn't uh, something that we had uh, focused on, but that is definitely something that I'd like to try to interpret our findings based on, but. Great. <laughs> uh, no, excuse me, I know that was a very dissatisfying answer. It's okay, <laughs> there, will be, there will be other chances to talk about this. Nah. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Alexandra. We have Anneke after Anna, after Pete and after Marco. Anneke, please. I will try to keep it in order. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't necessarily have a question. I was just uh, clapping my hands. So, uh... Okay. Okay. The number is Anna. Do you have a question? Anna Chagas? Uh, no, I don't have it. No, I don't have a okay, question. So I, I saw it quickly. So maybe Pete uh, had something to say. No, I was clapping also. <laughs> okay. So I misunderstood. Marco, it's your turn. <laughs> You're on mute. And we have Isabel. I, I would say it's a very fantastic talk and uh, very promising also uh, results. So um, so have you, what, what would be nice to see actually, if you, if you can do this in the future, but uh, to look at transcriptomes to see if they are maybe still active. Yes. Yeah. That's uh, absolutely interesting. I've definitely seen uh, some works from the, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, the Arabian Sea that have uh, tried yeah. to look at uh, ancient RNA. But uh, no, that's, that's a really uh, an yeah. really interesting premise. We, we, actually, it's interesting because we saw these same groups, like even actinobacteria and sphingobacterialis, was it, no, sphingomonas, and so, et cetera, also in the the Chicxulub deep biosphere, like a thousand meters below the Earth's surface. These are actually thermophilic organisms there. And um, so, yeah, they're, they're also in the deep biosphere. So it, it's, um, I mean, you think we see some correlations with past environmental proxies, but we're talking about 50 million year old sediments. So it's a bit uh, old. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so these things could very well, especially at the order level, uh, they are quite ubiquitous also in sediments. So, but you, you did see the correlations with the with the surface uh, water. So, but but at what level, at what taxonomic level do you think you have to go to be very certain that you're really looking at at something that's really from the water column, as as opposed to what's maybe still indigenous to the sediment. Uh, well, we were absolutely guided by the uh, curves from our recruitment plots. So we're really trusting that uh, the delineation of the distantly and yeah. closely related populations, you know, um, right. or the trough was at 90% similarity. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. No, no, I, uh, yeah. yeah, no, that's really great. Yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it difficult to do this bioinformatically or? Uh, no, I, I think it's actually a pretty accessible tool. Uh, there's a lot of different mappers out there. We use one called BBMap because it allows some oh, okay. yeah, flexibility yeah. with regard to the sequence uh, identity you could assign or cut off rather. Yeah, okay, thank you. I think we have Isabel now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I had a question uh, who was rather similar to, to what uh, was said just before by Marco about the active taxa and, and the interest in transcriptomic or working on, on RNA. So it's okay, we have uh, discussed that. But I was just perhaps not really comfortable with one thing in the conclusion, or perhaps I, I have misunderstood. You said a small fraction of sediment metagenomic are historical lacustrine archives, but what do you mean? You mean that most of the sediment of the metagenome you found in the sediment is just um, the reflect of uh, taxa living in sediments. Is it what you mean? 
that's what I meant to say. But uh, also, um, I think it's important to recognize the limitations of using the uh, surface water um, metagenome as the reference genome, uh, because it's very limited in terms of it being, you know, it was a snapshot sample uh, taken, you know, one time a day uh, in one season in just one year. So it won't reflect, you know, like the, uh, how do you say, like a broader diversity of microbial. Okay. Of okay. microbial. But uh, yeah, okay. So so you can yeah uh, yeah okay. I, I agree. But my uh, perhaps my comment was also even if you see taxa living in the sediment, this is also historical information. No. Oh, okay. Excuse me. I guess uh, what I meant to uh, be more specific about was that it's um, a historical signal that matches like a planktonic uh, surface water microbiome. So something that we could pretty reliably say derived, you know, from the water column. Uh, but I see what you're saying that uh, I guess everything is essentially okay. historical in some sense. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Thanks a we, we have a question from Petra. Yes, you... hello. Uh, great talk, thank you. Um, I have a question concerning the um, reference uh, that you did with the top water. So I'm new to the uh, polar field. And um, so I just wonder, does it make a difference at which time of year, for example, you sample this reference um, <clears throat> genomes from, the, from this top water area? Would you expect different, or maybe would you expect to find different results if you sample it another time? Absolutely. I mean, ideally you would have a reference uh, genome, reference metagenome that represented, you know, like a, a year round microbial diversity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe different points in the water column, except that I would say that, you know, surface water is probably the most easily distinguishable from the sediment backgrounds. Uh, something other, something else to keep in mind, like as a limitation of using the surface water as a reference genome, is that it doesn't necessarily represent the microbial diversity that was present 150 plus years ago. So uh, you might want to have a reference metagenome that is as broad as possible in terms of the surface diversity that it represents. If I may ask another question. So if you would go to um, deeper lakes that are stratified in uh, epilimnon, metalimnon, and um, hypolimnon, you would, would you rather sample all three layers and pull this for reference? Or would you stick to just the top layer to have a clear separation? What would your approach be? Uh, that's an interesting or, approach. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I think it absolutely depends, you know, what you're looking for. Uh, mm. The fragments recruitment approach is extremely versatile in the sense that you could uh, recruit your sediment metagenome to any number of biomes, including, like you're saying, like different uh, layers within the water column. Uh, you could possibly have a combined uh, surface water reference genome that, you know, combines all these different layers, if that's what you're interested in. I guess it just yeah, I was just, I was thinking when in deeper layers, layers when they are mixed at one time of the year, then the surface biome is at one point in the year, the whole lake biome, and at another point in the year, it's only the stratified biome. Exactly. But yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing. It's a great idea. So, thank you. We, we have a question from Barbara Mogel uh, on the chat. She asked uh, what type of capture methodology you used. Uh, I guess she was talking about filter, maybe? Uh, I, I'm sorry, not I, exactly sure. Uh, what was the last thing you said? She was talking about... Uh... You, you can see it on the chat. Um, I don't know how to open it. <laughs> I would like to know which capture methodology you used. Could be arrays? Oh, excuse me. Uh, so the capture is, ex is uh, purely inside the computer. So what we call an in, in, in silico experiment. Yeah. So uh, you're just capturing uh, subsets of a metagenome just by performing this fragment recruitment. So that's what we meant by capture. But uh, there's no, we didn't manipulate, you know, the DNA in any sort of way before we sequence it. Cool. Okay, we will take three more questions and I think we can stop with that because it's a lot for Rebecca. So we have first uh, Andrew. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you for that uh, wonderful presentation. You're a bit low. 
Sorry. You are um, a bit low. A, a bit low. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. All right. Um, I, I'm also kind of new to the to this field of um, sediment um, metagenomes. I have a question on sampling sediments for um, metabar coding. Um, would there be an issue of um, like mixing of ancient and recent DNA with water seeping down the sediment column? And and are there strategies like to em employ to address this potential problem? I, I have to admit, I'm probably uh, not the best equipped in this audience to answer that question because uh, I. Is that for hours, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. Um, I, I think you could spark in a very interesting discussion if everyone hear about that. But uh, yeah, we should maybe we should discuss that a bit later. Uh, uh, we, if your question is, uh, will you contaminate your sediment when you take them out of the water? Yep, um, because um, water could seep down like through the sediment core, right? Um, would there be mixing of these re recent um, ah, um, DNA enriching. with the ancient yeah. DNA? Um, deeper yeah, into the sediment which, yeah. column. Uh, I'm not sure I'm very specialized enough to answer. Uh, in our review paper, we have a small section about that, I think. Uh, but this is a tricky question. It may depend. I'm sorry about that, Andrew. All right, thank you. No worries. We, we will uh, I mean, that. Excuse me, just want to comment on that. I mean, normally, it's not a strong flux of water downward through the sediment, right, for, for, for most lakes at least. Uh, and I guess that also with the sampling, it's just about a strategy to avoid, again, like when you bring your core up, that you avoid uh, the exterior that are in contact with the sampling gear. Uh, I yeah, guess. exactly. You take the inner part of the sediment and you take sampling control alongside your subsampling. The strategy to uh, control the contamination to avoid it completely, it may be a bit harder. All right. Thanks, everyone. So we have Tristan Cordier, and after Pritam, and after we will stop the question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, very much for your nice presentation. Very exciting result. It's more like a comment on, or a suggestion than a question, actually. Uh, just following up uh, with uh, your reference uh, metagenome that you take from the surface, you, you discuss very well that it's limited uh, because you, it's a snapshot at some point. And I was wondering whether you, you consider taking um, uh, available published me metagenomes from lake uh, water surface to augment your reference database so that you can probably map much more data from your sedimentary uh, DNA. Absolutely. I think uh, to keep this uh, this one particular study, which we really had envisioned as a like just a small little proof of concept, uh, we didn't do that. But you're absolutely right. And uh, just in this past year, there have been so many exciting like uh, data sets of lake microbiomes published. And yeah, no, no, you're totally right. I, at mm -hmm. some point, I am kind of doing that as like a hobby on the side. But uh, no, there is yeah. anyway a lot to do. I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you again. Great idea. Thank you. Pritam, you have the honor of the last question. Yes. Yeah, yes. it's so nice presentation. Uh, I have one more to that tricky question, but uh, uh, my question is different. Uh, in uh, When I we study, I, usually I study the eDNA. And when you study the eDNA for macroorganism, we really concerned about the false positive and false negative detection. Uh, in case of my microorganism, maybe there is the same kind of things uh, trend you need to be following. If you are going to a uh, lotic ecosystem when the water is flowing, sediments are accumulating from different places and the bacteria are also accumulating from different places. And you cannot make sure that that bacteria is present in that place only or that particular place only. So my question is that how will you make sure in lotic ecosystem that uh, your um, assumption is correct and that bacteria is uh, really indigenous bacteria to that place you sampled. Oh, okay. Interesting. Kind of wanted to answer a slightly different question about what you asked, but <laughs> give me a second. Uh, so we re really only took um, samples from the deepest point of the lake. So whether that represents the lake as a whole, I, I, I'm not super convinced. I think the littoral zone is also pretty important, you know, in terms of the microbial diversity you could find there. But you know, again, this is just a, a first little study. Uh, you're absolutely right. You could 
definitely do follow up. But uh, sorry, if I, I just want to make another comment just about, you know, potential contamination. It just like kind of sparked in my mind that one potential uh, piece of evidence, you know, supporting that we didn't have any, you know, we didn't have, you know, contamination in of, of our sediments is that we didn't find, you know, the abundant cosmopolitan actinobacteria or alpha protobacteria in the sediments. So I just wanted to put that out there. Case anyone sure. contamination. Then for that case, I also can mention that if someone wants to inside make the coral inside and avoid that contamination, they can do. They can avoid. They can separate the limnia and photic, photic and deeper the sediment zone. But when you need to separate the transport contamination, that's more maybe more difficult. You cannot separate the in sediment, you cannot separate the transport contamination. Uh, so when mm, sediment is transported from different places, you don't know. Uh, so that may be a tricky question or that may be a different things for future that we cannot, we need to separate the, to those uh, false negative or false positive detection uh, in case of more accurate result for uh, future metagenomics. I'm just here for the microbes. <laughs> 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 no, 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 you're totally right. <laughs> No, no, anyway, it's very good presentation. I learned a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again, Levika. Thank you for all your questions. Uh, I will